This is the fourth video in this series on pulmonary function tests, and today's topic is the diffusing capacity of carbon monoxide, abbreviated DLCO. The learning objectives are to understand the physiologic significance of the DLCO, to be able to use the DLCO to further characterize both obstructive and restrictive lung disease, and to know the conditions that can alter the DLCO which are unrelated to lung disease. Let me start with explaining how the DLCO is measured because that will make it clear as to what the value means. We start with a patient who takes in a single, very deep breath of a mixture of air, helium, and 0.3% carbon monoxide. Although carbon monoxide is very dangerous when inhaled in high concentrations, this is far below the concentration that would adversely affect gas exchange. The reason carbon monoxide is used is because it's highly soluble in blood, has a high affinity for hemoglobin, and is not normally present in the lungs or blood in any significant quantities. The patient holds his or her breath in maximal inspiration for 10 seconds, during which some fraction of the carbon monoxide will move from the alveoli across the alveolar capillary membrane via simple diffusion and into the bloodstream. After 10 seconds, the patient exhales. The first liter of exhaled gas is discarded as dead space, and the next liter or so is analyzed for remaining carbon monoxide concentration. The DLCO is a measure of how much volume of carbon monoxide diffuses per minute per unit of pressure across the alveolar capillary membrane. In the US, the units used are usually milliliters of carbon monoxide per minute per millimeter of mercury. The test is then repeated after several minutes, and provided that the two are in rough agreement, the mean will be the value reported, which is usually compared against a predicted value given the age, gender, and height of the patient. A measured DLCO that is less than 40% predicted is considered severe impairment. Since the carbon monoxide travels via simple diffusion, the DLCO effectively measures the overall function of the alveolar capillary membrane. This function can be qualitatively understood using Fick's Law of Diffusion, which states that the rate of gas diffusion is equal to something called the diffusion coefficient times the surface area across which the gas is diffusing times the partial pressure gradient, all divided by the thickness of the diffusing membrane. Thus, any lung disease which either decreases functioning alveolar surface area or increases the thickness of the alveolar capillary membrane will lead to a decreased DLCO. In many ways, the DLCO measures something quite similar to the alveolar arterial gradient as measured by an ABG. Although there is some conditions which affect the DLCO without affecting the ABG, for the most part, when the A gradient is elevated, the DLCO is almost always decreased. There are many pathologic conditions and physiologic states that can alter the DLCO. Those that decrease it include, as I just mentioned, anything that decreases surface area, such as emphysema, or anything that increases membrane thickness, such as interstitial lung disease. It also includes pulmonary hypertension of any cause. It includes anemia, since a decreased carrying capacity of carbon monoxide will necessarily result in a smaller partial pressure gradient driving the diffusion. Although it doesn't come up often in a clinically relevant context, there are a number of reasons why the DLCO could be higher than predicted. Exercise immediately prior to the test increases cardiac output, and the supine position changes the distribution of pulmonary blood flow and ventilation. Asthma has been empirically found to be occasionally associated with an increase in the DLCO. This has been speculated to be due to increased perfusion of the lung apices in asthmatics, though I personally wonder if asthmatics may also have increased surface area of the alveolar capillary membrane due to modest hyperinflation. Pulmonary hemorrhage increases DLCO by providing a pool of hemoglobin that carbon monoxide can bind to without needing to diffuse across a membrane at all. 
Polycythemia helps to increase the local partial pressure gradients as an opposite effect to that of anemia. Finally, mild left heart failure, in which there is increased left side of pressures, but with preservation of cardiac output, can result in an increased DLCO as a consequence of increased pulmonary blood volume. Obesity is occasionally listed among the causes of an elevated DLCO. However, the actual scientific literature on the effect of obesity on the DLCO is inconsistent. The predicted DLCO is often adjusted based on one or two issues. First, as I just mentioned, anemia and polycythemia can influence the DLCO. So the predicted DLCO should be adjusted downward for anemia and upwards for polycythemia. To make this adjustment, the PFT technicians use standardized equations, the details of which most providers will never need to know. The predicted DLCO is also occasionally adjusted to abnormal lung volumes, creating something called the DLCO to ventilation ratio. This adjusts the DLCO downward for low lung volumes and upwards for high lung volumes. Unfortunately, this adjustment can be misleading if the etiology of the abnormal volume is not carefully considered, and thus this should only be done cautiously and is usually not necessary. So how does the DLCO help us diagnostically? You will hopefully recognize this algorithm that we've been working on over the past two videos in this series. What additional information does the DLCO provide? The greatest diagnostic benefit is probably with differentiating the etiologies of restrictive lung disease. If the DLCO is low, it implies the patient likely has interstitial lung disease, while if the DLCO is normal, it implies the patient has an extrathoracic cause of restriction, such as a chest wall disorder, neuromuscular disease like ALS or diaphragmatic paralysis, or obesity. In addition, the DLCO can be used for patients with obstructive lung disease. A low DLCO suggests more of an emphysema subtype of COPD, while a normal DLCO suggests a pure chronic bronchitis subtype of COPD. As most patients with COPD fall somewhere in the middle of the spectrum, most have low DLCO, and it will be normal in only very few. In addition, patients with asthma also have a normal DLCO in most circumstances, but occasionally a high DLCO can be observed, as mentioned a few moments ago. Finally, among patients with normal lung mechanics, the DLCO can differentiate people with pulmonary vascular disease from people with completely normal PFTs. Testing the DLCO is not always done as part of the conventional PFTs because the equipment it requires is relatively expensive. Therefore, one must be selective as to who warrants the measurement of the DLCO. Primary indications include categorizing a patient with restrictive lung disease as either probable ILD versus extrathoracic restriction, identification of early ILD in high-risk patients such as those on long-term amiodarone, a history of chest radiation and stage 1 sarcoidosis, quantification of anatomic emphysema in patients with COPD, and finally to document disability for legal purposes such as receiving state disability funds. That concludes this video on the DLCO. The next and final video in the series will present some example cases to test your PFT knowledge.